to efficiency chapter chapter 5 so we did about covetousness idolatry we did as uh, we did love walking in love so from verse 8 onwards for you are once darkness but now you are light in the lord walk as children of light for the fruit of the spirit is in all goodness righteousness and truth finding out what is acceptable to the lord if you can just we'll stop at that verse 10 finding out what is acceptable to the lord and then we'll go uh, we'll go a little further to verse 15 it says see then that you walk circumspectly not as fools but as wise redeeming the time because the days are evil Therefore, do not be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. So, we'll just concentrate on these verses. Here, uh, verse 10, finding out what is acceptable to the Lord. Do not be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. And do not be, okay, we won't go into that. So, verses 10, 15, 16, 17. Understanding what is the will of God in our lives. Now, the Bible gives us a general will of God for us. You know, God is telling us what, in a general way, God is telling us what we need to do in our lives. So, we know the things that we God expects of us. We have to walk in truth and righteousness and self-control. We know all that, okay? All the good deeds, going, assembling together, love one another, do not be drunk with wine, but be, uh, but be filled with the Holy Spirit, be led by the Holy Spirit. So this is something God wants for all Christians. So we all know what God wants for all Christians. But there is something, see, there are, there's a deeper walk with God. Like how do I know which career I must take? How do I know whom I should marry? How do I know whether I should do go for this particular function? How do I know whether this is the will of God? So, you know, God wants us to walk in such a way that we are always walking in the will of God. Now, it's, it doesn't happen for everybody. We need to walk very intimately with God to know the specific areas in which God wants us to walk, right? There are certain specific areas. Now, how do we know the will of God? How do we know the will of God? Unless we know the will of God, how do we walk in the will of God? So how do we know, for example, whom should I marry? Not for me, not for all of you. Let's say somebody who's not married. You're married. No. So if you were to, if you wanted to know whom, I mean, if you wanted to know from God whom you should marry, what would you do? It's not in the Bible. They don't do things like, you know, just open the Bible and suddenly the name Ruth comes and you say, no, 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 God wants me to marry Ruth. See, all that is a kind of very, it's a kind of playfulness, which is, uh, and then you go and marry Ruth and Ruth may be the wrong person for you, okay? Or you just again Esther and, I mean, there may be an Esther. Huh? Oh, your name is Ruth. <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> Or an Esther, I'm talking of the names in the Bible, you know, Rebecca, you just open the page and then you think that is God's will. That's not God's will. But how would you go about finding out God's will? What does he mean by saying, do not be unwise? Find out what is the will of God. How do you find out God's will? See, now let's take mm -hmm. the examples in the Bible. Abraham, God told Abraham, I'll give you descendants like the stars of the sea, okay? I'll multiply your descendants. How long did Abraham have to wait till he got Isaac? 25 years. In between, sometime uh, uh, before that, Sarah gets impatient and says, look, I don't think, I think you've waited enough. God has promised, I'm sure what God said is true. So why don't you sleep with Hagar by May and you can have descendants through Hagar. Now, did Abraham inquire of the Lord? Did he ask God, Lord, my wife is giving me an idea. Do you think it's good? Huh? Abraham never inquired of the Lord. And he went ahead with his wife's proposal. Because in those days, having wives and concubines, nothing was wrong. It was not, actually, it was nothing wrong 
what Sarah said was nothing very wrong in those in the cultures, in those cultures. So Abraham said, okay, God never said I give you a son only through Sarah. Maybe he has a plan to multiply my descendants through another woman. And he went ahead with it. Now what happened to that particular phase of his life? He got Ishmael. Now what happened to Abraham because of Ishmael? It wasn't the will of God. God wanted him to wait longer. He promised he would give a descendant through Sarah, not through Hagar. But today, what is the repercussions of what Abraham did? Many thousands of years. Abraham lived during 2000 BC. So today, what are the repercussions of what Abraham did? Ishmael is all the descendants of Ishmael are the Arab country. And the descendants of Isaac is Israel. And even today, even those days, Isaac and Ishmael were at war. Even today, the Arab countries are still fighting with Isaac. And you know, God didn't, you know, God is so good when he loved Abraham because Abraham honored God. Abraham obeyed God. He told Abraham, because he is your son, I will bless him also. But he said, send him away. You know, Sarah says you have to send him away. You know, they're getting too proud. Just because she's born a son, she's getting too proud. My maid is trying to prove that I am better than you because you are barren. And I have given Abraham a son. So Sarah said they have to leave. And God told Abraham, yes, listen to your wife. They have to leave because I will give you another son. The son of promise was Isaac, not Ishmael. So even Abraham suffered a lot of pain because of this ungodly decision not just the year not just the arabs and the israelites who are living even up to today they're still fighting with one another but even abraham suffered imagine sending away at that time ishmael was the only son that he had known sending him a, sending away a son who was born in his very old age even ishmael would have been a very precious child to abraham and Abraham just obeyed God and sent Ishmael away. Do you remember how he sent Ishmael away? Just send them, send this lady with a child with some water and some bread into the desert, trusting in God that God will take care of Ishmael. And God promised him, I will, I, I will make him into a big nation. But the problem started from the time Ishmael was born, right? So it was an ungodly decision, something that God had not intended, but Abraham did it. And today we are still seeing Israel, Ishmael and Isaac fighting. In fact, both of them came together to bury Abraham. When the father died, both Ishmael and Isaac came to bury Abraham, but they were always at loggerheads. It's two different religions, two different religions fighting with each other, even today. Right? So that was one ungodly decision that Abraham made. Anything else you can remember in the Bible? There was only one person who perfectly did the will of God. And that was Jesus Christ. He said, I do nothing of my own. Whatever I see my father doing, whatever he tells me to do, I do. I do nothing of my own. Jesus Christ was the only one who perfectly did the will of the father. And what do you mean by perfectly doing the will of the Father? You won't believe what it means. It means everything that you do every day, everything you say every day is in accordance to the Father's will. I don't know whether you've read this book, but I have, it's called Breakthrough. It is by one of the founders of YWAM. YWAM is Youth with a Mission. It's an international organization. So uh, uh, I forgot the name of the person who wrote it. He was one of the pioneers of YWAM. And in those days, it was written in 1980s, where uh, Rudolph something, something with R. The name of the book was Breakthrough. But it's an excellent book to understand how people walk with the Holy Spirit. Literally, they do not even take an apple from the table if it is not in will with the Holy Spirit. And their major work was the pioneering work going to communist countries giving Bibles in communist countries. Very, very dangerous work. Like if you're caught, you're just killed, you're executed. Nobody, no trial, nothing. Nobody will even know anything about you. You're just plainly executed on that day. 
So these people, they had to, they carry Bibles to all these countries. And communist countries, you don't know who's a spy and who is with you in this endeavor. You can be give, given over to the police and no word will be heard about you. So literally, they have to listen to the voice of the Holy Spirit. You know what they will do? They will fast and pray and they will wait for the Holy Spirit to say the same thing to everyone in that group. Now, for example, they are going to Hungary. The, they are praying about when to cross the border. Now, the Holy Spirit will tell at 5.30, you have to cross the border. Because, you know, there will be a change of petrol people, right? So, the Holy Spirit is at 5.30. Now, one person hears it at 5.30, another person hears it at 6, and another person hears it at 7. They don't carry through. That prayer is lost. They go back because the Holy Spirit is the spirit of truth. He will only speak the truth. He cannot speak many truths to many people because that's not the truth. Many truths are not the truth. There is only the truth. Okay? So they will be fasting. They will be praying. And correctly, the Holy Spirit will speak to them saying 530 cross the border. Now, you know, you all, we all know what it is to hear from God. What it is to hear from God? Do we really get an audible <laughs> voice? It is an impression. When we say God told us, what does it mean? There's an impression, right? There's some, uh, it's a voice, but an inaudible voice. It's an impression that we have. We could be wrong. We could be wrong. So now these people cannot go wrong. If they go wrong, they'll be beheaded. They'll be executed. So they have to hear correctly. Now they have Bibles stacked in their van. It is illegal to carry a Bible into a communist country. Now, um, that is another thing. They will only speak the truth. If somebody stops them and asks them, what do you have? Do you have Bibles in your van? They cannot tell a lie and say, we do not have Bibles. They have to tell the truth and pay for it. So their prayer is, Lord, let not that person ask the question, because if he asks the question, we will only tell the truth. That's the commitment with which they go into this communist country. One mistake they make, your life is gone. And they literally go thinking their lives may go. Because we are all human. We may think we heard from God, but we may not have heard from God. We would have made a mistake. And because of that, we will end up in deep trouble. So he is one of those, uh, the person who writes this book is one of the people who did a lot of pioneering work in YWAC. And he died at a good old age when, you know, normal, how normal people die in old days. Went through some of the very, very, I mean, the circumstances where it was touch and go, like you could have been easily killed. So, you know, like, um, so two people go, the Bible and the car is stacked with Bibles. And as soon as they, you know, they 5.30 or to cross the border means they will wait 10 minutes before that. Because even five minutes before or after can mean death. So they come to the, the border correctly at 5.30 and whoever is in the border will be a sympathizer. There are a lot of secret Christians in all these communist countries. So whoever will be a sympathizer for them. And remember, they cannot tell a lie. And actually, many they will go and check the van and they will pray, Lord, make the seeing eyes blind. Literally, God blinds their eyes. Because, you know, Daniel says, you know, God sent his angel and shut the mouth of the lions. Like that, God sends somebody and blinds these people's eyes. They will check the entire van full of Bibles and they will not find anything. It's a miracle of God. But that much, with that much precision, they walk with the voice of the Holy Spirit. They will go inside. They don't know where to go. They don't know which church to go. It's all underground church. Even the underground churches, you have to speak the right things. You cannot say anything you want. You can be caught by, because underground <coughs> churches also, a lot of spies will be there. Whom to trust? And literally, they will hear the Holy Spirit saying, turn left, turn right, go straight, come to that point. Like anybody, any human person will guide them. The Holy Spirit guides them. They give the Bible. They meet the right person, give the Bible. And they come and there will be a team praying for them at the base. 
throughout when these people are doing this work, there will be a team praying for them. Because that much, with that much clarity, they walk with the Holy Spirit. They repent. You know the things they repent of? Lord, that last piece of apple that was on the table, forgive me, Lord, I grabbed that last piece of apple on the table. That much they will repent. That much of their flesh they will cast out before God. Because if you are in the flesh, you cannot listen with clarity the voice of the Holy Spirit directly. The flesh is always opposed to the spirit. It is contrary to the spirit. So people who are in the flesh, not in sin, in the flesh. That is why he says, Lord, I grab that last piece of apple on the table. You know, when you read all that, you know, like literally as I said, Lord, there are people who are great in the kingdom of God. There are people who are great in the kingdom of God. They have literally, they have sacrificed everything to come into your kingdom. You know, they're willing to give up their lives, not like all of us. We are not even willing to give up small things for the Lord. They're willing to give up their lives. You know, literally they say, we don't care. Like if we die, we die. Like Esther, no? she said, if I perish, I perish. But I am going to go to the king and ask for the lives of my people. You know, it is that kind of a situation. Mm -hmm. So they hear from the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit directs them. They go to a foreign country, a communist country. Gives, they give the Bible to the right people, come back. Some, somehow the Holy Spirit guards them and they come back successfully after a mission. So find out what is the will of God. It's so important because when we know the will of God, that whole plan is sanctified. Whole plan is sanctified. Now I want my son to go to America. Now long back we had a pastor who said, I would like to go to America. After that, let God be your America. Okay, I'd like to go to America, but after that, let the whole, let God lead me. That is within America, let God lead him to where he must go. But I want to go to America, that is my will. After that, within America, where I should uh, go, let God lead me. You know, see, we, <laughs> we cannot become like that. We have to, when we say, Lord, you are my master, is his plan, if you are in Africa and in God's will, it is safer than being in America outside God's will. If you are in Africa and you are in God's will, nothing will touch you. But if you are in America, in the safest place with all police around you, things can happen. Simply because it says we are in evil times. We are called, we are, because devil is waiting for us to come out of God's will so that he can attack us. It's not, God is not punishing us. Okay, I told her to go to America, but she went to Australia. God is not waiting to punish us. He doesn't want to punish us. He loves us too much. But Satan is looking, now she's in open territory. You know, he's like a roaring lion waiting to devour. He cannot devour everybody. See, all those who are in God's will, we are like we are like in a safety net. We are like in Noah's ark. Nothing can touch us. Nothing can touch us. We are in the will of God. It's the <coughs> safest place, even if it is the ark that is uh, being thrown aside by all the floods and the water. Nothing will happen to you. You are out of the will of God. He's like a roaring lion to check who is outside the will of God so that he can roar and pounce on. So it's very, very important. That's very, it's a very important truth that we walk, we find out what is God's will and do what God tells us to do. Okay, now I picked up another incident. I think most of you may not know this incident. It is in the Old Testament, 1 Kings chapter 13. Can we do, can we take that? 1 Kings chapter 13. So this is a story, I don't know whether you all know about it. It's from 11, 1 Kings 13, 11. It doesn't tell the name of the prophet, it says man of God. 1 Kings 13, 11. Now an old prophet dwelt in Bethel and his sons came and told him all the work that the man of God had done the day in Bethel. They also told their father the words which he had spoken to the king. Okay, I think we have to go a little further. Okay, let's start from here. The man of God entreated the Lord and the king's hand was restored to him and became as before. 
Then the king said to the man of God, Come home with me and refresh yourself and I will give you a reward. But the man of God said to the king, If, if you were to give me half your house, I would not go in with you, nor would I eat bread, <coughs> nor drink water in this place. For so it was commanded me by the word of the Lord, saying, You shall not eat bread, nor drink water, nor return by the same way you came. So he went another way and did not return by the way he came to Bethel. 1 Kings chapter 13. So yeah, it starts, no, no, I started reading from verse 6. 6. 1 Kings 13. See, this is a story of Jeroboam and how he went. See, a king cannot go into the, you know, the he cannot minister because the king only the Levites can minister. So Jeroboam was not a king. He was, uh, he, you know, there was a, uh, I mean, split in the kingdom between Rehoboam and Jeroboam. Rehoboam was, became, who was son of Solomon. Okay, so there was a split in the kingdom. Now Jeroboam was the king of Israel. So now there is a man of God whose name is not given. And he tells the king, God has told me, not to drink water or eat bread in this place, nor go back the same way as I came. Okay, this is something that God told the man of God and the man of God tells the king. The king says, I'll give you a reward for what you have done. But he says, no, I do not want a reward because God has told me not to do anything in this place, not to drink water also in this place. Now an old prophet dwelt in Bethel and his sons came and told him all the works that the man of God had done that day in Bethel. Now there is another old prophet in Bethel and his sons come and tell him what this man of God had done to Jeroboam and what he spoke to Jeroboam. And their father said to them, which way did he go? For his sons had seen which way the man of God went who came from Judah. And he said to his sons, saddle the donkey for me. So they saddled the donkey for him and he rode on it and went after the man of God and found him sitting under an oak. Then he said to him, Are you the man of God who came from Judah? And he said, I am. And he said to him, Come home with me and eat bread. And he said, I cannot return with you nor go in with you. Neither can I eat bread nor drink water with you in this place. For I have been told by the word of the Lord, You shall not eat bread nor drink water there nor return by going the way you came. Then this older man of God, the prophet, said to him, I too am a prophet as you are. And an angel spoke to me by the word of the Lord, saying, Bring him back with you to your house, that he may eat bread and drink water. He was lying to him. Okay? So he went back with him and ate bread in his house and drank water. Now it happened as they sat at the table that the word of the Lord came to the prophet who had brought him back. And he cried out to the man of God who came from Judah, saying, Thus says the Lord, because you have disobeyed the word of the Lord and have not kept the commandment which the Lord your God commanded you, but you came back, you ate bread and drank water in the place of which the Lord said to you, Eat no bread and drink no water, your corpse shall not come to the tomb of your fathers. So it was after he had eaten bread and after he had drunk that he saddled the donkey for him, the prophet whom he had brought back. And when he was gone, a lion met him on the road and killed him. And his corpse was thrown on the road and the donkey stood by it. See, literally a roaring lion. Here was a man given specific instruction from the Lord not to eat bread, not to drink water, not to go to anybody's <coughs> house, not even the king's <coughs> house. But another person lies to him. He says, I'm also a prophet, but God sent his angel and told me to bring me to your house. That's why uh, Paul says, now, even if an angel comes and gives you another gospel, do not believe. Even if another angel comes and gives you a word of God that is not in keeping with the word of God, please do not obey. Because it's not that God is saying, okay, okay, you drank. I mean, is it something, is it so insulting for God? That you, you know, went and drank some water and ate some bread in somebody's house. I mean, obviously this man lied to him. He told, I have no intention of disobeying God. But he was taken in by this prophet who told a lie. 
So it is not God who ever wants to punish us. He knows we are frail. He knows we make mistakes. But when, when God says something, you don't obey those words. You will have to suffer consequences. Adam and Eve, from the first, from the very beginning, Adam and Eve have had to suffer consequences of not obeying the word of God. Not that they did something terribly wrong. The Satan deceived her and she just got taken in by the seductive words of the serpent. Not that Eve wanted to deliberately go against God. Adam ate, did what his wife wanted him to do. But still they had to suffer all the consequences of this. This man, he was, he believed the lie of this prophet and a lion came and mauled him. So this is a allegory, I mean, it's a true story, of course, but it has got a lot of meaning for us that the devil is a roaring lion waiting to devour those who are outside of God's will. Those who are in God's will, a tempest comes, the whole world is flooded, nothing will happen to you like in Noah's ark, right? Noah's ark, the whole world was flooded, the water rose above the mountain. The ark was being tossed and turned in those reckless waters. Nothing happened to them and all the animals that were inside the sea. You are safe inside God's word. As long as you are within the will of God, within the words of God are sanctified, they are holy. Nothing will touch you. If God tells your son, go to Africa and minister to me there, he is safe in Africa. But if you feel Africa is not the country for your son, you want your son to minister in America, he is in the most dangerous place. He can be easily devoured by the lion. Parents make these mistakes so often. One of my husband's relatives, you know, this uh, he had a very good job in Pondicherry. He was doing very, but he has got a tendency for asthma. And the mother and the mother-in-law, they kept on entreating the son. We are getting old. Nobody is there for us. We want our son to come back to Bangalore and take care of us. And Bangalore is known to produce greater asthma, right? And because mother is crying, mother-in-law is crying, they decided to go back to Bangalore. And his asthma became so bad. He had a young daughter who was just four years old. And he just he died of asthma. And his daughter was only four years old. And his wife was so depressed. She didn't want to live. I think she lived for 10 years after her husband died. And she also developed some problem. And she died. So 10 years later, this girl was 14. So she was taken care of by her uh, grandparents. And one day she came to my house. Uh, I don't know why she came. For some reason she came. And uh, we were talking. And she said, why did God do this to me? Why did he take my father and my mother? Everybody, either one parent may go, but not father and mother. Why did God do this to me? He took both my parents and me. And uh, everybody is telling me God did that because he wants, he wants me to come closer to God. He said, I'm already close to God. I be, I'm a believer. I'm quite close to God. He didn't have to take my parents away for me to come closer to him. So, she, so I said, I don't know why God, I said, I don't know, I, I didn't say why God took your parents. I said, I don't know why both your parents died. Today, now I know, I think, but that time when I spoke to her, I didn't know. I said, I don't know why both your parents had to go. But I know one thing, that God is a good God. Despite the circumstances of your life, the word of God says God is good. And if you dare believe in the goodness of God, you will see the goodness of God. That is what David believed. You know, he was, David had to run 40 years from one person. Another 40 years he had to run away from Absalom. First person he ran away was Saul and Saul was jealous of him. He never questioned God. You know, he said, I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. He mocked death and said, Lord, what's the use of dying? Because the grave cannot praise you. And I will see your goodness in the land of the living, not after I die. We will all see the goodness of God after we die. But David said, no, I will see the goodness of God in this earth I will see. 
So this happened and I told her that if you dare believe that God is good, you will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. So that one night I, she was at my house and I spoke to her and then after that I don't know anything what happened. I believe then she went to Australia, she miraculously she got a study loan to go to Australia, study. Now many years later, fast forward, my son goes to Australia, he goes to Perth and she's a relative like her mother is my husband's first cousin. So we just found out that she was a relative there. So we gave him her number and when my son went there she told him do you know how much god has blessed me i've got a fantastic husband i've got a fantastic job i've got two houses in australia i've got two lovely children everything was because your mother years ago i happened to spend one night and your mother said god is good i don't know why your parents died but god is good and if you believe god is good you will see the goodness of god she said, miraculously, doors started opening when I believed God is good. I, I didn't want to look at my circumstances. Why things happen that way. But now I know one thing. You know, parents are sometimes, see, these are the stumbling blocks. The old prophet, come and stay with us. Come and eat bread in my house. Parents are like these prophets. We don't discern the will of God for our children. Please, we are old. Come and look after us. Now, who looked after whom? Those two parents are still alive and the son and the daughter-in-law are dead. They called their son from Pond. He had a, he's a, a graduate from Indian Institute of Technology, Madras, brilliant student, had a very good job in Pondicherry, pulled him out of the job, brought him to Bangalore. The old parents are still alive while uh, the son and the daughter-in-law are dead. What did they achieve? discern the will of God. Don't do things out of your weaknesses, out of your desire to be with your children. Everybody desires like that. We want our children to be our security. And this happens to most old people. And I'm praying that I will not become like that in my old age. When, uh, you know, towards the end of her life, my mother-in-law, she only needed to see my face. And I literally told her, I have become your God because I am the person who gave her. If I am there in the house, she is very happy. I told her, I said, nothing will happen to you when I am outside the house. God entrusted you with me. So whatever happens to you will happen only when I am there with you. So don't worry. But still, no, as you grow older, you start getting insecure. You start getting scared. You don't see your son. You don't son was always in the hospital so she got used to it daughter in law she's seen more often and she's i mean she's a believer she's a person who really loves the lord but it is a human weakness seeing her i am praying i said lord let me not make others my security my children my security in my old age you know in isaiah there's a verse that says even unto my old age you are my lord my god and Zakun and all of his quotes this verse and says, I have four sons, but I did not bring up my sons to take care of me. In India, you know, we all, it's, a, it's an understanding that our children will take care of us. And if they don't do it, all hell will break loose. Allow your children to do the will of God. I have to tell that to myself. It's easy for me to say this now when I am healthy. But when I'm old, when I'm weak, when I'm infirm, can I say the same thing? I trust Jesus. And Zachman says, I've surrendered my life to Jesus Christ till my last breath. Jesus alone should look after me. I have not brought up my children to look after me. I have brought up my children to love the Lord and worship the Lord. It's not easy at all. It's very difficult. But even I, I have to preach this for myself. I am praying, Lord, give me the strength, like when I am old, let not my son become my security, let not my daughter or my daughter-in-law become my security, let God and God alone become my security. Because when we do things outside the will of God, we do kind of emotional bribing, Satan gets a hold on them. So now, the son was brought out of God placed him in Pondicherry. He was brought into Bangalore. Now, that doesn't mean he should die of <coughs> asthma. Unfortunately, he, he already had bad asthma, but it was well controlled in Pondicherry. 
Bangalore it went out of control. Now what about his wife? It seems from that time her husband died, she was in deep depression because later on I heard whoever went to meet her, she would say, I want to die, I want to die, I want to die, I want to die. Death and life are in the power of your tongue. Death and life are in the power of your tongue. If you keep on saying, I want to die, I want to die, I want to die, you are attracting death towards you. God is doing nothing to you. God doesn't want you to die. He wants you to live to declare the praises of God. That is why David, even though David had the sentence of death upon him, because he committed two grievous sins. But David repented for his sins and he started declaring the praises of God. He said, Lord, I, the grave cannot praise you. Death cannot praise you. What is the use of a dead man? But I want to live to declare the praises of God. David started speaking life and eternal life overcomes death. Life is about death. So we need, so now if she asks me why did God take away both my parents, I will say God did not take away both your parents. God placed you in a good family. He wanted father and mother to take care of you. He did not take away both your parents, but your parents made some foolish decision that gave Satan power to attack. Your mother was depressed. Why do you get depressed? When you have as long as Jesus Christ is your Lord and Master, He is your hope. You don't have to die because your husband died. She got depressed. She always spoke death. A lot of people later on told me that any time they came to visit her, she will only say, speak words of death. She simply didn't want to live. So sometimes we are the ones who bring death and destruction to ourselves. It's not anything happen, anything bad happens, we blame it on God. Lord, why did you allow that to happen? God never does bad things. He cannot do, his character cannot change. His character simply cannot change. God is the same yesterday, today and forever. If bad things happen, it is not from God. Every bad thing is from the devil. Every good gift is from our Heavenly Father. I am not saying it, the Bible is saying it. Every good gift is from the Heavenly Father. If a son asks for a fish, will your Heavenly Father give him a stone? Now, we don't have the answers to all the problems in this world. God can give you the answers if he wants to, but we don't have the answers. But the problems in this world happens because we are not doing things that are perfectly in the will of God. It requires a lot of patience. It requires a lot of perseverance to wait for God's timing. How many believers, you know, like when it comes to marriages, you know, there is a timing. God is waiting for them to wait for a time when the children will get married. You know, God wants good things for his children. Always wants good things for them. But you know, we get impatient. How long we have waited we can't wait any longer. Okay, the next proposal that comes, let us go into it. See, and things go wrong. And then we blame God. Lord, didn't we pray? Didn't we ask you? But did you really hear God telling you to do that? What about ministry? You're so full of desire to do a ministry. You will just do the ministry that looks good to you. It may not come from God. I've read the autobiography of this man called Jim Elliot who went to the Oka Indians in South America, the most uncivilized people in the face of the whole earth. Now, Jim Elliot, when he came to the Lord, he was so full of desire to serve the Lord and he wanted to serve the Lord in one of the most dangerous areas in the world. And he kept asking, you know, this was that area, that Oka Indian area, which he wanted to, you know, go and minister there. So he and six friends, you know, they decided to do it. And they kept praying and praying and praying. No answer from God. So, it, so finally they said, okay, Lord, we are doing ministry. We are doing a good thing. We are, going to, we are going to give the gospel to uncivilized people. God is not going to get angry. We are doing the will of God. So these five people, you know, such an uncivilized uh, 
uh, uncivilized uh, group of uh, they're in uh, they're right into the deep jungles in Ecuador so these five people five guys they come down from a helicopter and one of the tribals one lady had run away so these people took a photograph of hers to show these people look we are friendly people we know your friend who left your tribe these people have never seen a photograph what they thought is they these foreigners have come and flattened this this tribal girl because they've never seen a photograph so they did they thought they're doing a wise thing they from the helicopter they dropped her photograph when they saw the photograph they got scared they didn't think they were friends immediately they took the bows and arrows before these people landed on the ground they shot all the six of them were killed and you know all of them are young men 28 30 just married they just have one or two small children the wives were devastated lord didn't our husbands go and do some dangerous work for you why is it that you did not control what happened in that island you know they were so distraught they were so depressed they couldn't believe that a good god will allow something so terrible to happen all the six of them were killed instantly how could this happen yes they have trained they have learned linguistics they have learned languages to communicate to these uncivilized people there's no written word there no you have to talk they learned linguistics they prepared for years to go into this hostile territory how could god just let them down they were devastated maybe five or six years later one of the wives of jim Elliot, along with the sister of one of the guys who went and Elizabeth Elliot, I think she was just three years or four years old. These two women went back to the tribe. They said, no, we are going back to the tribe and we are going to give them the gospel. These two ladies with this child, they go back there. And this time, the whole tribe, they received them very, very enthusiastically. They said, do you know, when we killed you, see, they were not bad people. They just thought that these people are enemies because they flattened that girl. Uh, round human girl flattened onto paper they couldn't understand they said when we killed these people we saw angels singing on the trees you know and these two women they lived with them they gave them the gospel the entire tribe they became Christians and uh, the head of the tribe baptized Elizabeth Elliot you know she was uh, she's a daughter of Jim Elliot she was just three or four years old a fascinating story where you know the only mistake Jim Elliot did was move when God had not instructed him to move but finally it was his wife and the sister of another person who went who were one of the people who were killed who finally transformed that entire village they were the most on today they, they are they have a church there Today, they wear pants and jeans and walk around like any one of us, educated, given the gospel. But they were prepared to receive the gospel because actually they said, we saw angels singing in the trees. We have never seen such a sight before. We knew that we did something wrong. We did not know what we did wrong. Nobody came to tell us uh, anything about God. We didn't know. And we were waiting and we just knew that someday somebody will come and give us the story of why these angels were singing in the trees. So they received the gospel. It is it's incredible thing, but the whole message is find out what is the will of God. So these are important areas, which job you take, which career you take, which girl you have to get married, which boy you have to get married. But in everything, in day-to-day -day activities, try and find out the will of God. So how do we find out the will of God? How do you know it's the will of God? No, that's what I'm saying. The certain things and whom should I marry it won't be there, no? What if his name is not in the Bible? Like Deepak is not in the Bible. How will you know? <laughs> All that is right, but the only problem is if I'm in love with somebody, I will think I heard from God that that is the person. That is the problem with, see, when you are objective about it, you can discern better. 
this is the will of God. But if when you are so much in love with that person, you start imagining God is telling me this is the person. Because we are not able to separate our emotions from the word of God. This is what I want. So God, you please bless what I want. You know, it's it come, becomes something like that. Peace. Yeah, all everything what you're saying is right. Only thing, it's not easy to discern always. <coughs> Our emotions get in the way. You know, like uh, we want something very badly. We start on thinking that God is also telling us to do that very thing. How many people of God have made mistakes? If it was not so, there should be no divorces among believers. There should be no, um, you know, wrong uh, things that have happened. Like I start building a house and the whole thing crumbles. These things should not happen if God has led you to do that particular thing. God will not ask you to do something. He will not ask Noah, build the ark and later on go and break the ark. He won't do that. When God tells you to do something, it will be foolproof. Nothing can go wrong in that area. It doesn't happen like, you know, God like a hotline. I just get hold of God. Now just tell me what should I do in this area. And then I keep the phone down and I get the answer. God, it is a constant fellowship we have to have with God. See, I should be aware of God's voice. How can I be become aware of God's voice? I should be constantly hearing it to know that it is not the voice of the devil, but it is the voice of God. You get that? There's no shortcut. You have to be constantly in the in fellowship with God. The branch, the, the branch has to be plugged into the wine at all times. You cannot suddenly say you plug out, live your own life. Okay, now I want God's advice. I go plug in. I get an answer and I plug out. It doesn't happen that way. I have to be constantly aware of the voice of God. Let the peace of God remain with me. Now, there can be artificial peace also. If I want something badly, I can imagine the peace of God is in me and I might do the wrong thing. We need to be... We have to confirm, we have to reconfirm, we have to reconfirm. Be very sure this is the will of God before you take any, before you plunge into it. Like Abraham did not inquire of the Lord and he made a mistake which had lasting repercussions. You and I can do the same thing. You know, we build a church, we have plans for the church, you have plans for your family, you have plans for so many things. And if you are walking out of the will of God or just walking in your own pleasures, I can tell you 100%, you may think you are hearing the will of God. You may not be hearing the will of God because the flesh strongly opposes the spirit. But a person who is consistently in fasting and prayer, consistently in fasting and prayer and walking in the ways of God, not in the ways of the world, that person, you can be sure, will hear from God. Because there are two things that oppose the voice of God. One is the world and one is our flesh. So when you are fasting, our flesh is being stifled. And when you walk with God, we are not walking with the world. Either you are walking with the world or you are walking with God. Only two ways. If you are not for me, you are against me. If you are not walking with God, you are walking with the world. So the world and your flesh, these are the two things that cut into the voice of the Holy Spirit that may prevent you from hearing from God. But if a person who is walking in the Lord and given to consistent fasting and prayer, he will hear from God. So that is one very important thing. Then uh, I would also say that um, the gift of discernment, you know, there are many gifts recorded in the Bible. The gift of discernment, how to discern the voice of God. Now, Paul, you know, when that lady, when that uh, uh, girl who had the spirit of divination, you know, she said, these are the men of God. They were telling, she was telling the truth. These people are people who worship the living God. But Paul knew this came not from the Holy Spirit, but from an evil spirit. It was a spirit of divination. 
So that is remarkable. You need to have such a strong sense of discernment to know because they're telling the truth. Right? So how did Paul knew, know that this lady is speaking the truth but not from the Holy Spirit but from an evil spirit? How did Paul know that? Because Paul was walking so closely with God. He said, imitate me as I imitate Christ. I will never tell anybody imitate me as I imitate Christ because I know there are so many times I don't imitate Christ. But Paul was walking with the Lord. So, you know, there is a sense of discernment. You know, once we had gone to Bangalore and, uh, you know, there's a group of flats where one of the flats we had bought and this builder who's a Mangalorean who became a believer, he had called a lot of his friends who had bought those flats to have dinner with him. And we are meeting each other for the first time. One is a Bengali, Malayali, Tamilian, you know, all, but all of us believers. And he was very happy to give, may, may allow all these believers to buy flats in his, that building. And that whole night we were talking as if we have known each other for years. And that day the Holy Spirit, this is how heaven is going to be. You know, people from different nations and tribes, you are all going to sit together. And what is connecting you to all of them? It is the Holy Spirit, your brothers and sisters in Christ, simply because we are one with the Lord and the Spirit. So we need to ask God to sharpen our gift of discernment. But as Regina said, there's no shortcut to walking with the Lord. Talking to God, knowing his voice, asking him for confirmation. God loves it when we ask him, we allow him to enter into small areas of your life. Even if you ask him, Lord, should I wear this dress? The Lord is happy. You know, like my daughter will ask me, Ma, can I wear this dress? You know, I feel happy that she is, you know, allowing me to enter into her sense of dressing. So God is happy with each and every small area in which we allow him into our life. Because he loves us so much, he loves to be part of any part, not only the big things in our life, even the small things in our life. So, and he says, since we need to redeem time. What's the meaning here? Redeeming time. Ephesians chapter 5. The days are evil. See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise. Now, remember here, it is not saying that don't walk as wicked people, but don't be foolish but be wise. So it is not sinfulness that is a problem here. This is foolishness. Be wise in understanding what the will of God and redeeming the time. What is the meaning of redeeming the time? Because the days are evil. Redeeming is getting back something that you lost. So if you have lost things by disobeying God, then be wise enough to get back everything that you lost. You don't have to lose. You have your heavenly father to guide you. So redeem the time. You have lost time because you went by not walking with the Lord. Now redeem the time. What you lost for six years, God can give it back to you in one year. People who have lost properties, people who have lost their wealth, God has replaced everything in one year. You know, God can redeem the time because the days are evil. And it, you know, very important if you go back to Proverbs, the book of Proverbs, he's not talking so much about wicked people. He's talking about foolish people. Wise people are the people who go with the word of God. Foolish people are the people who are not evil people. Foolish people are not evil people. Foolish people think they are wiser than the words of God. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. Foolish people lean on their own understanding. Wise people trust the word of God. So there's a difference between wise people and foolish people and wicked people and righteous people. So here it's not, it's not evil people who suffer always. It is foolish people who suffer more than evil people. And who are the foolish people who lean on their own understanding without giving credence to the mm -hmm. word of God? 
So we start this new year trying to find out what is the will of God in almost every area in our life. The more you allow God into every small area, the better your life is, more successful you are. Because God can give you wisdom in every area of your life. Even small things, what you should dress, what you should not dress, which shop to go, what to buy, which color to buy. You know, we go in our own understanding, we look at something, it's very beautiful, we come home, we wear it, we look so bad, we'll never wear it. Right? That in every small area. I am learning to do that for a long time. I'm bringing God into every area. The clothes you wear, what, how, I mean in every area. What you eat. If I listen to God about eating, I don't think I would have put on so much of weight. So in every area, if you are able to bring, allow the Holy Spirit. Because God loves the whole of you, body, soul and spirit. Every aspect of you he loves and he can redeem. If you have lost something, if you listen to him, you can get it back in no, in very short 